Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. Mike Veach to my left. I'm Mark Cassano. My partner's working hard this morning. In a couple yeah. of minutes, his second pedigree <laughs> of the morning. But now, a look back at the Santa Anita Derby. You know, my memory isn't what it used to be, but I really can't remember for quite a while okay. a major stakes race changing so much due to late scratches. That's right. I mean, this one did. This race this one on did. paper when they drew it was one thing, and it ended up being 180 mm -hmm. degrees different. First, the morning line favorite, and one of the speeds, the Pample Moose was scratched. Then Z Day entered as the rabbit for Pioneer of the Nile was scratched, essentially taking out all of the real speed. Mm -hmm. Now take the points, owned in part locally here by Don and Barbara Lucarelli, who was supposed to scratch to run in today's bluegrass. He ended up running because the Pample Moose was withdrawn. <laughs> so this race was all topsy-turvy. <laughs> The post time favorite at four to five, number four, Pioneer of the Nile, while the second choice at two and a half to one, number one, Chocolate Candy. Now, both these Colts, particularly the latter, like or need to have a pace to run at. Pioneer of the Nile is far more adaptable than Chocolate Candy, in my opinion, and he's going to make a very early run to the leader, Feisty Suances. They're going to go 24, 48, and three. And you're going to see in a moment, folks, he's going to be pulling very hard against Garrett Gomez. Remember, this colt at his best likes to sit off the pace, race covered up, and make one run. Also, Pioneer of the Nile kind of loses interest when he makes the lead early, and that's going to happen in here. He's going to make the lead early in the stretch, and again, he's going to win ugly as he holds safe a late bid from Chocolate Candy to score by a length in the Santa Anita Derby. Now, Garrett rode him the way he had to in here to win the Santa Anita Derby, not the way he really wants to ride the colt. But let's face it, the pace is dead. He knows he's sitting on the best horse. And you know what? I'd rather win ugly than not win at all. That's basically I'm having it. trouble with this race, and um, I, 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 it has nothing to do with respect for the horse because uh, he's now completed his sweep of the graded stakes preps in California including the big one and the historic one, the Santa Anita Derby. I, I, I've, the, the question in my mind, it doesn't have to be in, in our fans' mind, but the question in my mind is this picture of him down the bad stretch, literally, <coughs> as they used to say, pulling the jockey out of the saddle. I don't know if it's good or bad, Mark. I really don't know. I don't know if two races back, when he found himself in that position, Pioneer of the Nile has suddenly decided, gee, this is where I really want to be, as opposed to that first race of the year when he came from way off the pace, swung out wide right. with that great desk. Right. I don't have an answer to that, and I think that's what you folks have to decide in your minds is going on here. I think it's totally admirable that he wins this race, and totally admirable is that, is that he literally drags Garrett to the front, just drags him there, then he gets him to settle a bit, then he comes on and runs again to win this race. And I agree with Mark's comment. It's a win ugly like the last time. We've got a really good horse here, but I've got to throw up the asterisk. It's called the synthetic surface. I mean, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. Is it Colonel John? I really don't know. And uh, if he moves as well as I want revenge moved, well, uh -huh. then we've got a whole different story on Kentucky Derby Day. But it's a nice measured win. I just don't know. And... and and for me, complicating it, and this is not a criticism because, I mean, Bob Baffert is just a tremendous trainer. He loves to drill his horses oh, yeah. hard, yeah. and that may be a part of it, too. I'm just saying that if I'm a Pioneer of the Nile fan and he's doing that, leaving the clubhouse turn at Churchill, I'm going to be worried. That's, well, that's what I'm saying. That's my only consideration. I'm not a seasoned handicapper. I just don't like to see that then. That's all. You well, know? I, I think your concerns you know. are legitimate. But at the same time, normally, the one thing you don't have to worry about in the Derby... you got to have a pace. pace. It's got to be there. And I agree. I do think I got, this Colt I, I agree will with that. settle. I want him to settle. you've got a legitimate pace running away best. from yeah. you up in front. Yeah. I think it's a credit to him. Not that he's beating a tremendous amount. No. Although I do think... Chocolate candy will be, you know, one of the many yeah, wise guy a, horses, a, you know, in yes three weeks. Is, yeah. But it's great to be able to alter your best I running agree. style I and still totally agree with be that. able to win 149, you know, on the pro ride. It's so much different than dirt. Final three eights, 36 and four. Final furlong, 12 and two. Baffert won his fifth Santa Anita Derby. Uh, chocolate candy, you know, no major threat. 
but a wide rally turning for home into a steady, you know, albeit unspectacular type of pace, that's a solid second. Both the first and second finishers from the Santa Anita Derby will try dirt for the first ever time in the Kentucky Derby. I just don't understand why trainers do that. Mike Smith will ride chocolate candy for Jerry Hollendorfer in the Derby. Now, with that said, I do feel it's easier for a good horse to go from synthetic to dirt than vice versa. Mr. Hot Stuff, a belated inside rally for third. He doesn't have enough earnings. And take the points, a one-paced fourth. I thought he should have ran better considering the pace scenario. Yep, yep. But you know what? All Pioneer of the Nile does well, is go out there uh, and win. That's respectable. And, and you, 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 you might say, you know, you might say that as a measure of his class, we were all um, enthralled with take the points his effort last time out. Maybe he paid a price for that against a high-quality horse. We'll have to see. All right, pedigree number two. Within this pedigree profile, and again, they're not labeled, so, so try to pay attention to the numbers. You're going to see a victory in the California Derby where he was number five. You're going to see a win-ugly victory in the El Camino Real where he was number seven. And then you're going to watch his rallying second in the San Anita Derby once again where he was number one. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael's look at chocolate candy. Beautifully named, bred by the late Sid Craig and Jenny Craig, owned by the Sid and Jenny Craig Trust, trained by the tremendous horseman Jerry Hollendorfer. Candy Ride is the sire, and when he came to this country from Argentina in 2003, he took us by storm. The aforementioned Craig's authorized Hall of Fame trainer Ron McAnally to purchase him for a reported $900,000 off his Argentine form, which included a Group 1 victory at one mile in 131 flat. <laughs> I'll repeat that, 131 flat. <laughs> the Craig's knew well the potential from Argentine breads, having had success also with Paseana and Grade 1 winner different. McAnally fiddled with him for a few months before turning him loose at the Hollywood Park summer meeting at which Candy Ride won an allowance and the American handicap on turf. Six weeks later, Candy Ride destroyed his opposition. It's the only word I can come up with. This included the brilliant Medaglia di Oro in the Grade 1 Pacific Classic, earning a buyer speed figure. I don't use these numbers much, but I had to throw this one in there of 123 for a mile and a quarter. Pretty good number. Julie Crone was aboard that day for the first $1 million score by a female jockey. Candy Ride never lost in Argentina, and he never lost in McAnally Shedro, and Chocolate Candy is a member of his first crop to race. This group also includes graded stakes winners Captain Candyman Can, last seen winning the Bayshore last week, and Avita Argentina, Winner over males in the San Vicente. Pretty good. Three graded winners from the first crop. Candy Ride is a son of stakes winner Ride the Rails, who finished second to Holy Bull in the 1994 Florida Derby and is a leading South American sire. This is the Raisin native line through Fapiano, the sire of Ride the Rails. Candy Ride is a very bright example of how a superb thoroughbred can come from anywhere. His mother, Candy Girl, was unraced, as was her mother, City Girl. City Girl, though, produced multiple Group 1 winners, City West, whose victories included the Argentine Jockey Club at a mile and a quarter. Chocolate Candy's mother is Crownette. This daughter of Triple Crown winner Seattle Slough, and we're going to use that phrase again and again, was bred by Calumet Farm, and she won the Santa Isabel Stakes at a mile and a sixteenth. In addition to Chocolate Candy, she's also the dam of Stakes Place Crowning Storm, who finished third to Tis Now in the Grade 3 Affirmed Handicap at a mile and a sixteenth. Second dam in memory by Triple Crown runner-up Aladar was an unplaced mare whose only stakes winner was the above-mentioned Crownette, but whose own mother, Won't Tell You, produced one of the greatest runners of the 20th century in Triple Crown Winner Affirmed. Affirmed, of course, amassed the 10 furlong derby, <coughs> the 9.5 furlong per Preakness, and the 12 furlong Belmont, in addition to such major events as the Hollywood Gold Cup and Jockey Club Gold Cup, 
both events at 10 furlongs, and both over tremendous foes such as Spectacular Bid and Aladar. His mother also produced Love You Dear, winner of the matinee stakes at one mile, and placed in the grade three Wilshire handicap at a mile and a sixteenth, both on turf. Won't Tell You also produced Silent Fox, third in the grade one Struba 10 panels, and Won't She Tell, winner of the one mile Blush with Pride stakes on turf. But don't you find it fascinating that, as if to uphold in some mystical manner, that a firm's mother, when bred to Aladar, produced the windless in memory? Never mind the gods of the Kentucky Derby, the gods of the breeding shed also direct events in ways that we will never fully understand. Chocolate Candy's fourth dam, Scarlet Ribbon, was about as ineffective as second dam in memory, but his fifth dam, Native Valor, came from a highly valued family that in succession went to three of America's most prestigious and influential sires, all of this section to show you the family of our Santa Anita Derby runner-up, what he inherited. It began in 1928 when Nature Smile, the eighth dam of chocolate candy, was bred to fair play, the sire of the one and only man of war. The result of that mating was Native Wit, the seventh dam of chocolate candy, who in 1938 was bred to Sir Galahad, the sire of America's first triple crown winner, Gallant Fox. The Sir Galahad native wit mating produced the mare native gal, the sixth dam of chocolate candy, and the mother of Billings, winner of the Hawthorne Gold Cup in a mile and a quarter. Billings was by Mahmood. Mahmood was bred by the Aga Khan, and he was a startlingly brilliant winner of the Epsom Derby in 1936. C.V. Whitney purchased Mahmood four years later, and Mahmood would soon become one of the most influential sires in the New World. Native Gal also produced the good multiple stakes winner, Royal Native, winner of the Monmouth Oaks, the Spinster, the Arlington Matron, and the Black Helen Handicaps, all at a mile and an eighth. And winner over Hall of Fame Philly Silver Spoon in the Oaks and the Matron. Native Gal in 1946 was booked to Mahmoud, the year he was America's leading sire through the exploits of his juvenile Philly daughter first flight, the C.V. Whitney champion who defeated the boys that year in the Belmont fraternity. That mating produced Native Valor, who became the fifth dam of chocolate candy, or the mother of the aforementioned fourth dam, Scarlet Ribbon. So this collection of native gals went successfully, successively to three of America's leading sires, and when we say leading, we are saying a mouthful, especially when we are listing Fair Play, Sir Galahad, and Mahmoud. Point I'm making, these were valued mares. Through chocolate candy, the Craigs have brought back to prominence a family that was very important to the American breed in the middle decades of the last century. So if he wins on the first Saturday in May, I suspect Jenny won't mind telling her weight loss centers to look the other way and celebrate with chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> chocolate candy has a very good foundation, he, having started he nine does. times. He's in very good hands. I wonder if Mike Smith will be thinking of Giacomo as uh, they come out of the tunnel on Derby Day. Not that this horse is going to be 50 to 1 like Giacomo was, but you know, this horse, I liked him back in the Hollywood Futurity, and he simply wasn't quite okay. good enough. He ran third beat in a length and a half. You know, handicappers are going to have to assess how much he's improved uh, from that time. He will benefit, you know, probably just as much as Pioneer of the Nile with a legitimate early pace in the Kentucky Derby. Uh -huh. He's four of nine, over a half million, 9.75 on the top, 9.65 on the bottom for an overall 9.70. Let's take a look at uh, yeah. all of Michael's numbers right now on the class of 2009. And unfortunately, the Pample Moose with the lowest number is out. But I want revenge tops the list at a very, very solid 9.975. Yeah. One final comment, Mark. Uh, you know, Chocolate Candy, his number's not the top one there, but... On pedigree and just that, my gut feeling with this guy is that he really will blossom at 10 panels. That's just okay. my gut feeling. This is a really balanced pedigree and a deep pedigree. Well, so there's going to be a lot balanced. of people hoping that's the case yeah. on Derby Day because yeah. they're going to back him. Quality Road yeah. is a very nice 9.750. Yeah. There's Chocolate Candy. Old Fashioned starts later this afternoon in the Arkansas Derby. Frisian Fire. Pioneer of the Nile, a much weaker overall pedigree mm. than his rival Chocolate Candy. And there's Desert Party at 8.9. Michael, thank you very much fun. for that uh, doubleheader this morning yeah. with the pedigrees. Um, <clears throat> pool three of the Derby Futures actually closed here in New York 
last Saturday evening uh, at 10. Here's a look at the closing odds and the favorite, and, and this is certainly not a surprise, <coughs> I want revenge off that Wood Memorial victory at 4.5 to 1. Here's the irony, and I think you folks who are regular viewers of this show, you basically know how I feel about these future pools. No. Um, <laughs> I want revenge, the favorite in pool three. Ironically, of all the horses in all three of the pools, I want revenge offered the most value. Not in pool three, but back in pool one. Because pool one was conducted the weekend where I want revenge looked. He appeared to hang in the stretch mm -hmm. when running third in the Robert Lewis. Mm -hmm. What we didn't know was, and what turned out to be the case, he hated that surface. Mm -hmm. He was 54 to 1 in pool one. Oh, wow. 54. Lord. He was the longest <laughs> price of any horse in Pool 1, oh, Lord. including horses who, as I said that day, would need public transportation to get a mile and a quarter. 54 to 1 in Pool 1. The other interesting thing about Pool 3, it did not include Square Eddy. And of course, it's not going to include Flat Out because I'm the only one who even remembers that horse. So there's a look at the closing odds from Pool 3. One of the horses they're hoping to get into the Kentucky Derby is Charitable Man. Charitable Man was a very nice two-year-old, having won the Belmont Futurity, coming off his maiden victory at Saratoga. The only problems, we haven't seen Charitable Man since the Belmont Futurity, and that was last September 13th. He's trained by one of the nice guys in the game and one of the absolute top trainers in the game in Kieran McLaughlin. And yesterday, I had a chance to sit down and chat with Mr. Kieran McLaughlin. Kieran, as our audience watches Charitable Man in his last start, the September 13th Belmont Futurity, and I'll remind the audience he's breaking from the outside post position, Karen, where has he been for the last 210 days? Well, that's a very good question. We miss him, and he had a saucer fracture after that race. He had a, a crack in his chin, and so we put a screw in it and then took it back out. And I believe they took it out December 1st, and he went on to Ocala, and uh, Ian Brennan at Binary in Ocala did a great job with him in December and January. And then we picked him up late January and started working him weekly, pointing for this race. Karen, as you mentioned, he's been in training at Palm Meadows for quite a while. Have you been pleased with what you've seen? Yes, he's trained very well. We were not only pleased, but a little bit surprised how fit he was. The first couple of works that we had, we worked him, and I told the rider just to go easy three eighths. He went 37 and, you know, just kept going and did not get tired. So then we worked him back six days later, and he went 36 up in 49 again and just did everything right and then kept working from there. And his, his last three or four works have been great, uh, 59 and 3 here at Keeneland, 59 and 4 at Palmetto's the week before that, and in a minute flat twice the weeks before that. It's a tough task at hand, but he's doing very well. You know, Kieran, if I may say, and, and, you know, we've been fortunate enough to have you on this show for, for many, many years, this seems to be a little bit out of character for you. I mean, a lengthy layoff, 210 days, one race back in the bluegrass, and then possibly a start in the Kentucky Derby. Talk about that, if you would. Right. That's, uh, it's true. It's unusual for us. And and our thinking was that he's a top three-year-old. We think that he's a top three-year-old, one of maybe the best ten on the East Coast, and uh, therefore we wanted to give him a chance. And if he made it and everything went right and, and he had no issues at all, then we could point for a race April 4th. We, we were thinking we would be ready for April 4th. We opted for the bluegrass because of the poly, and we feel like horses come off the poly races that and it's kind of you know, than the dirt races, and especially if the dirt it happens to be sloppy, and if you point for the wood, mem wood memorial and it came up sloppy, you would be upset. So we decided to point for the bluegrass for the last month or so. We've been pointing for this race because horses come off this 
growth track, um, and that is that they don't react uh, bounce, you know, per se, off of the poly like they do a dirt track. And we think it's easier on a horse and kinder on the horse. So if he gets a little bit tired, he gets a little bit tired, but they'll probably go 24, 49 and change, three quarters and 14. And that's a big difference in three quarters and nine and four on the dirt track or 10 and change. So if he comes out of the race in good shape and runs in the top five, we think that he has a legitimate chance to win the Kentucky Derby. We're not just going to run to have a runner. That's not our style. So aside from the graded stakes earnings situation, what exactly is he going to have to show you in the bluegrass to say, okay, let's go on to Louisville and try the Derby? Right, and that's a good question. We feel like that there's only one other speed horse in the race. Join in the dance, Todd Pletcher, Johnny Velasquez will probably be on the lead. And we're going to be fresh, and we have pace and speed, so we're going to be probably laying close to him in second. Hopefully we don't get into a speed duel and we just be sitting out there relaxing in second. And and if he gets a little bit tired and finishes fourth or fifth and uh, comes out of the race straight and does, does not get beat 10 lengths, then we would probably go on to the Kentucky Derby. If he gets beat double digits and finishes eighth, we're probably going to regroup and and look at uh, the races later in the summer because he's a very nice horse and there's a lot of opportunities for him. Karen, how has Charitable Man changed, well, physically and maybe mentally, from two to three? He's very matured looking. He's, he's matured well, put on weight, filled out. He's a, he's a very, very nice horse. He does everything right, and he looks great, he moves well, and he's got a great mind. And he didn't have to change a lot, but he just grew up a little bit from over the winter. And we hope that he runs very well because we think he will. Well, you sound awfully excited about your colt. And before I let you go, got to talk to you about your wonderful three-year-old filly, Just Whistled Dixie. Here she is in her most recent victory, the Bonnie Miss at Gulfstream. Talk about her for a moment, Karen. Well, you know, Art Magnuson had her in New York for the winter. We started there, and he did a great job with her, and she won a stake. And I talked to Terry Finley about, you know, we needed graded earnings to improve her value, and we always thought that she would stretch out. And we were always asking her for to go six furlongs. We were having to ask her early and stay after her. And I thought going a mile or further, she would just be there and relax and, and come running. And the Devona Dell was a perfect spot to try and stretch her out. And she stretched out beautifully that day and then came back to win the Bonnie Miss with Julian LaPeru. He was filling in for Alan Garcia while he was in Dubai. So Alan Garcia will ride her back in the Kentucky Oaks. And, you know, she's a very nice boy, does everything right, and a neat boy to be around. And is it five in a row she's won now? Yeah. Four in a row. And, 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 you know, Karen, it's been interesting because this spring we've gotten teased that maybe a couple of fillies were going to run against the boys. And, of course, they were stardom bound in Rachel Alexandra. But when the late nominations came out to the Triple Crown, there's the name Just Whistle Dixie. Why was she a late nominee to the Triple Crown? You would have to ask somebody other than myself because I certainly would not have done it. <laughs> and I, I, I told Terry Finley that, and he said Lewis Lakin owns part of her, and, and he put her in the race. And I and, uh, just thought, you know, uh, why not? You know, it's $6,000, and let's do it. But, but we're definitely not running the Kentucky Derby, and um, I would doubt that we would run the Preakness or the Belmont. So I'm not sure why they put her in there but you know you never know things strange things happen but uh we're gonna stay with the Philly. well karen as always we appreciate your time thank you so very much for having joined us this morning on down the stretch all the best with charitable man coming back later this afternoon in the bluegrass all the best with just whistle dixie in the kentucky oaks and we'll look forward to speaking with you again very very soon thank you very much karen mclaughlin ladies and gentlemen the conditioner of charitable man it's just really pretty interesting and uncharacteristic for Karen, 210 days off. Yeah. But isn't it interesting, his explanation of 
why the bluegrass? They've never run them on synthetic before, mm -hmm. but the fact that this is a, such an unusual attempt, one race and then possibly to the Derby, he feels horses come off the synthetic yeah. and aren't going to bounce or regress nearly as much. And a very, very good, if you're going to go, you're going to get a lot of nine furlong conditioning on the synthetic, you know, and if, as he says, you know, they come out of it better, then that's, for his circumstances, an ideal prep under less than ideal conditions. I mean, it's really asking a lot, but uh, as Mark and I were talking during the interview, the synthetic thing is not going away. It's highly discussed all the time.